Let's go to Matt in the SLC out in Utah. What's up, Matthew? Hey, Dr. Dean. My heart is racing. <laughs> Kelly doesn't even have a heart, man. So it's all good. Just kidding. Hey, you're good, man. What's up? Uh, well, I'm calling because I'd like to figure out why the repression of my self-expression causes me distress. Tell me more. Yeah, so I, I wrote a script to organize some of this, right. um, and it ended up being kind of like a journal entry. <laughs> it definitely stopped me or slowed me down if, uh, if it seems like a lot, but we're going to keep it nice and light. Hold on, hold on. All right. How off the rails are you willing to get? Oh, we're, we're going all the way. Okay. We're going to get way off the rails. So I can tell <laughs> 13 seconds into this call, two things. You are so good at repression and you're very, very smart, sophisticated even. And whatever your repression is about has been something that you've gotten so good at navigating that you've created poetry and flowers all around it. So I'm going to challenge you. I don't want to hear your diary. I want you to say it in one sentence. My name's Matt and here's what I'm wrestling with. My name's Matt, and I'm wrestling with a lifelong uh, repression of myself. Matt, you're still, do <laughs> you're still doing it. You almost got there, and then you chickened out. All right, let's try it again. I'm Matt, and... I'm Matt, and I am a lifelong liar. Keep going. What are you lying I've about? I've hidden myself away from everyone in my life. Um, just about everyone in my life, uh, specifically as it relates to cross-dressing. Okay. Hey, I want you to go backwards and own it for a second, okay? Can you do that? Absolutely. Because we can't get anywhere if Matt doesn't like Matt. Yeah, there's a lot of self-hatred there. I can feel it all. I can just feel it. <laughs> I can, man. And if we were sitting right here, the first, I would stop all conversations and I'd give you a hug. I appreciate it. Okay. You would have to buy the beers, but I'd give you a hug. Just kidding. I'd probably want to. Okay. Two, 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 two guys have a nachos. All right. The way you introduce right. yourself is I'm a lifelong liar. The way I introduce, you introduce yourself is I'm a lifelong liar theater performer. I'm a scam artist. And I disagree. Often, when we have things that we don't want to tell anybody about, our immediate childhood environment says, if you say this out loud, it's going to get you killed. It's going to get you hurt. It's, people are going to leave you. And so often, you can call it lying, fine. Sometimes, I call it survival. Okay. Yeah. I want you to make peace with Matt. So tell me, what, tell me what we're what, what we're doing. You, you've you've have you been thinking about cross dressing your whole life, or you have been and just hiding it from people? Tell me more. Yeah, I, I have been. Um, I I think it would help if I if I went to the script. I think it, it yeah, just like you said, it paints a, a, a picture with flowers. Um, if you're cool with that, let's do it. Um. Yeah. So. Listening to your show made me heed trauma that I previously disregarded, and it made me feel compelled to take the SPCC ACES quiz, and I scored a 10. Wow, um, my brother. Hey, I can I just stop life. right a second? Stop, stop, stop. I'm so sorry. Uh, for a while, I, 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 I thought it was an 8, and some digging got me to the 10. <laughs> <laughs> you just said that like you get a prize. There's no prize. <laughs> no, <laughs> Yeah, it, it it depends how you cut the lines around these things, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's just say that somebody that should have loved you and taken care of you dragged you to hell. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. And then you tried to get out and they wouldn't let you. And uh, they loved me the best they could and they, they were great. I love them still today. Stop, stop um, defending them. Stop. I don't even know what the deal is. The person I want you defending is little Matt. Okay. Yeah. All right. So tell me, 
tell, keep going with me. Then what? Yeah. Uh, twice I wanted to end my life and once I tried. Okay. Um, I've set down uh, many bricks, but still carry some from the period. Yep. And I said, I, I was a liar that curated my story. I never felt comfortable telling those around me about my cross-dressing, which was seldom expressed and very personal at the time. Mm-hmm. And once I did, I lost many of the people closest to me. And it, it really was a self-fulfilling prophecy that the, the thing that I was shut out for wasn't necessarily the cross-dressing, but the the closure that, that I, I was a, a walking liar. Are those your words or theirs? Theirs. Okay. Um, I, one example uh, I had, you know, all, all the groomsmen at my, my wedding, uh, all but one had known about me. Uh, and then once the, that one last one did find out, uh, he rallied the whole group against me and, then I was invited to one of their weddings, uh, which, which, which my wife and I flew out to, and I was threatened with physical violence. And I'd, I'd say I stared it in the face. I, I, I stayed through the party. Um, and I don't, I don't think I've quite set that one down yet. I, 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 I miss them horribly. Um, and I, I did catch on the last call that, that ability to try and soothe others. I felt like I was there for, all these people through a lot of their darkest times, mm-hmm. a lot of the hardest things for them. And then just one, one whiff of who I am. Um, and, and they all turn their backs. I'm sorry, man. <sighs> okay. So now, now we're through that, the heavy stuff, but, um, <laughs> hey, we're right. not getting through this for a long time. I mean, <laughs> I mean that, Fear of abandonment is one of the great human fears. One of the things that our we our bodies we fake and we maneuver and we cheer and rally. I mean, look at political rallies. There's no way all the people in those things believe a hundred percent, but we're willing to go along with it because of fear of abandonment. Why? Because true abandonment feels like death. And you experienced it. it. Really did feel like it. Yes. Because that version of your life is over. It's over. The one that had, where people had your back and that y'all could tell each other everything and you showed up for each other at 2.30 in the morning, they left you. And here's why I keep, here's why I want to stay there for just one second. It's easy to point fingers and it's easy to miss them, but you got to go through grief. You got to sit in it. And it's your body's way of saying this happened this was and that is no more and i hate that your friends even just, i hate your friends i'm that. sorry you, no i'm even just, just hearing it from you saying that that they they left you they're gone um did breathe a huge sigh of relief it was it's kind of nice to hear it not from someone else and not or from someone else and not not try and figure it out yeah there's nothing to figure out man when when your friends abandon you to your face and let's go this far even if they're right like let's came out and said, Hey, I'm having an affair with my, with somebody else's wife and this and that. And your friends are like, I'm out of here, dude. That still hurts. Right. Yeah. Or if you come out and say, I'm struggling with X or I've got this or I can anytime your rider dies, look at you and say, Nope. And they're out. It's, it's death. It's devastating. That old life you had is now over and you got to figure out out of the ash what to do next. And if you have an ACE score of 10, often our friends become our families. They take on a larger than life role in how we love and how we feel safe and how we do life shoulder to shoulder and kneecap to kneecap. And I don't know. There's just something profound. Parents leave, family leaves. All right. That sucks. It's heartbreaking. It's hard all that. Friends bail on us. All right. So tell me about cross-dressing. How long, since you were a little kid, you were older, tell me about it. Yeah, since I was very little, and it happened intermittently, um, kind of on and off for periods. It was something that I could always kind of bury for, for periods at a time. Um, uh, and then, Let me ask you this, and, and I'm doing this partly as a, a educational for me, because you're teaching me, and for the audience, okay? So this isn't gratuitous. Um, tell me about, was it just 
you felt a sense of anxiety relief by just wearing comfortable underwear or when people were out of the house, you had a, a stash of a dress somewhere. Like, tell me, tell me, tell me what it looked like. Yeah. Um, I think more curiosity at first, okay. like early on, I remember stealing some like a uh, tool from the, the Thanksgiving display. It was uh, like a little material uh-huh. and I, I, I put that around myself as a skirt and it was something that I'd done by myself and then kind of hid away. Okay. And, um, there were other times, uh, like at a family event, I, I found myself in, in like a cosmetic drawer and saw, uh, like, like maxi pads. And I, I didn't know what the hell they were, but it was just this, this intense curiosity for what it was. Mm-hmm. And then that evolved into when I was, uh, I would say like middle school into high school age, I, I started, um, finding articles of clothing that I could wear on my own secretly that I'd hide away. And still somewhere in my yard, there's a hole that I, I buried, like a skirt that I was afraid someone would find. <laughs> I'm just laughing at like some farmer's going to be mowing his yeah. yard someday and be like, uh. Um, so was, when you it say- It all like six inches deep, for real. <laughs> so when you're talking about like discreet, you're talking about socks and underwear? No, um, more like skirts. I, I went to a, a private school and there was, there was uniforms associated ah, with it. And okay. So in the lost and found, I'd like found a skirt that I could take with me. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And so how is this? Is, is your does your wife know? Yeah. So that's one of the big things I take solace in is that the day she met me, I had my nails painted, okay. and um, we hit it off so great that day. And then that that night, one of these friends that that ended up leaving me said, "You got to call her, man. She uh, she thinks you're uh, you know the hard f word and." Uh, you got to set things right with her and tell her that it, it was a joke or something. And, uh, so I talked to her about it. And oh, so when she met you, she you thought know, you were gay. Yeah. Okay. Um, she didn't, but, but he said she, she, she did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. To kind of maybe protecting the group. I don't know what he was, what his plan was. Um, Hey, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll me. pause here real quick. Cause I know this is going to, I, I can already see where this is headed. There's something called, um, I just lost it. What is it called? Uh, Fundamental attribution error. You ever heard me talk about that on the show? No. It's when we get into somebody else's head and try to come up with a story as to why they did what they did, why they said what they said. What I would tell you is fundamental attribution error is a complete and utter waste of our time. And I would tell you, stay out of people's heads. Who cares? Like the guy- oh, I live there. The guy, I know, I know it does. And it's, it's uh, haunting. It's haunting. Because the stories you create are always infinitely worse because you are the always the whipping boy in those stories. And yeah. it's hard to look at somebody and be like, man, even if I had been gay, it, do I like, are you not gonna be my friend? Are you gonna lie? About, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's hard to even go there and challenge your friend. It's easy just to look in the mirror and be like, I suck, which is what most of us do. With it. So stay out of people's heads is what I'd say. You have enough going on inside of yours. I'm confident, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's so much the core of what what ails me is is this this living in people's heads and having this dialogue that I'm I'm finding more and more isn't true. That's right. That's right. And it's uh, this it's disorienting. Okay, so your uh, your wife knows, right? Yeah. Okay. So she knew from the get go. Um, and as our relationship grew, so did uh, my expressions in it. It was something that we shared together, and it wasn't any anything that she ever tried to restrict my expression, but more just made sure that I was, um, like, let's say, appropriate for the weather or whatever the the situation so, was, or that I felt comfortable in my own skin was important to her. So, so we all have the same pictures and words. When you say expression, are you talking about um, y'all would get together like for movie night, and you might. Um, wear women's clothing and y'all snuggle up on the couch and watch the movie together. Are you talking about y'all went to the movies out in public and you went and had dinner together um, with you wearing women's clothing? Both. And okay. early on, it was, it was like very seldom um, that we would go out in public. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that, that grew some and, and we became more comfortable doing that. Okay. And did she, um, was she on heightened alert for people double taking or was she like, whatever, this is just my, Husband's wackadoo, and it's all good because I love him. Yep, the second of the those. Second she, one. She, 
Yeah. And I was always kind of high alert in those early days, mm-hmm. just thinking that there was going to be some outward act of violence towards me or okay. something. I didn't, okay. I didn't know what I expected. So let me ask you this. When you, when you, when you call it expression, when you put on women's clothing, is it an anxiety release as though you've identified women's clothing as something that is, that is safe and relaxing and soft and feminine? What, what is it about putting on women's clothing? Or are you in the process kinda, of, of, of considering transition? A little of column A and a little of column B. Okay. Um, I think there is like a, a safe bit of it. I don't, I don't consider that I'd, I'd go through any medical procedures, but even this afternoon, I, I got laser treatment to remove some facial hair, okay. which hurts like all. Because <laughs> they shoot your face with a laser. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, it's pretty traumatic. <laughs> it is rough. Um, but it's, I have anxiety building and then it's something that I do to relieve that anxiety. It's a relief. Okay. Um, but it's, it's the contrary that I build relationships and the, the less that people know that part about me Mm -hmm. and the longer I know them, the more, uh, untrustworthy I feel. Okay. And, and being outward about it, I feel like I, I, I tear down that wall and that, that people just get to see me as who I am. Okay. Let me just say it this way. I'm going to head directly into this conversation in, into a, like a, I'm going to make a pretty direct statement and I wanted you to hear me say it's a statement I've been making for decades across all different kinds of, of uh, challenges people are experiencing. Okay. And so, but I also know that by making this statement, it's a hot button issue. So I need to, I need to know you and I are on the same team on this. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. Team. So when somebody calls my show and they tell me I have anxiety, you've probably heard it. I always tell them you're experiencing anxiety. This is not anxiety is not a core identity. And so when you tell me this is who I am, what I want to, like, I want to hug you and say, you are Matt and this and this and this. And I know that's very unpopular because we've in our culture currently in this, in this little moment in history, we have braided together identity and who I am and these things that make me feel safe or these things that make me feel less anxious or these make things that make me feel a little more at peace. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And so what I'm going to tell you is, like, you're my brother, Matt. Worthy of being loved. And your body goes, Whew, when you put on women's clothing. Now, I'm open to being wrong there. Tell me if I'm wrong or if that, if that strikes a chord with you. Uh, it, it definitely strikes a chord. Um, more process-oriented, but um, I, I wouldn't say that you're, you're wrong. It's, okay. it's just the... The general behavior is um, things that I'd, I'd kind of compartmentalize as being feminine for fear of being found out, um, like taking care of myself hygienically, mm-hmm. um, that kind of stuff. I always just pushed off or almost went to the other extreme just to just to hide it. So yes, yes, and yes. Okay. I think that some of the things, some things are clearly labeled feminine and masculine, and I think anybody across any spectrum can look at it and go, yeah, that's feminine, masculine. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that is, it's a lot grayer than we like to pretend it is. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So you've led me here. What's like the, the, the question that's, that's sitting with you. I'm sure you've got a bunch of questions. What's, what's a big one I can help you with today? Yeah. So my wife and I had moved, you know, across the country and it, it kind of all came to a head with the, the birth of our child. I thought that it'd be like the last time I could put it all away and, and just kind of man up all, all at once. And that'd be the end of it. And it was like the, the opposite. Um, and, and I felt more, more compulsion than ever to, to just make sure that everyone knew, especially my son. I didn't think him turning 18 and uh, finding out something about me or whatever age. Um, I, I didn't think that would be healthy for him. Um, but that led us to her in my in-laws, her parents, uh, discussing moving out across the country and heard you say not by their hand, but in their lap, um, they have to deal with me in some capacity. I don't expect them to love and embrace me open-handed. 
uh, or open armed. Um, mm-hmm. But we did end up having a conversation about it, went about as well as it could. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess the the final stones I'm carrying, the final bricks I'm carrying with them is uh, that the father said, I'm not coming here to judge anyone, um, but it's something that has to be kept a secret from anyone, you know, back where we're from. And it was over the, the course of the next few days, I, I've been living an, an absolutely wonderful life. Um, my wife and I are very in love. Our child is healthy. Everything's good. We're baby steps millionaires. We nearly paid off our house. We did all the things to, to for me to feel like I could finally express myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, just being told, like, keep that to yourself. I don't know, over the next few days, I, I really just felt like I had to make myself small again. Um, it, it went away almost immediately, but, but that thought of uh, making myself very, very small happened again. And I don't know why, because it's not even something that I want to go back to New York and express these things to all these people. Sure. It's, I just want to know they're in my corner. Um, so let me, let me, um, is it okay if I push on you a little bit? Yeah, please. Um, I've, I've had, I've had similar conversations with people my whole career. Okay. Particularly 18 to 22 year olds with the students I was working with that were coming to realizations of all kinds. Okay. And they would come some, sometimes stumbling into my office. They didn't want something to be true. They finally wanted to say something out loud. And so, um, one thing I always told them, and again, maybe I'm wrong for saying this, but I always told them, your parents get a minute because your parents have this picture that they have had since the moment they found out they were going to have you. And it was going to look like X, Y, and Z. And now that picture is different. And they just get a minute. And they're going to say dumb things. And they're going to say the wrong thing. And they're going to, maybe in your father-in-law's case, he loves you and sees how well you take care of his daughter. And he loves how much how good of a father you are. And he also knows that he's got a bunch of bigoted idiot friends or moron friends or whatever back home that will abandon him the way your friends abandon you. And so there's some that. there's some place for compassion. There's some place for whew, his whole picture's different now. And I always want to go on both sides of the conversation. Now, I've had plenty of conversations with parents and who have called me and said, if I could do anything in my life over again, I would have that first conversation back. Right? So every it, it, this whole thing is so, so messy because people want to say what they want to say, but they don't know if they're going to say it. They don't want to be bad, but they also are like, hey, this is weird. I've never seen this or this isn't weird, but I feel all of it's so messy and so just the best you're able to, having a spirit of grace, I, it, it not only helps that person, but man, it gives you peace, right? Is that fair? Absolutely. Is that fair? Yeah. And I, I'd like to say, I, I don't, you know, I've been listening to you for a bit now and I, I don't feel like I've, I've held any resentment and that, that I'm you know, giving him grace. Awesome. Um, but that I, I also don't feel that there, um, the mother maybe more so, but I don't, I don't feel like it's an open conversation or that it's something that's revisited and the door was kind of shut. Okay. And so I'd, I'd never want it to be something so declarative, but I didn't want them to move across the country if it was going to be an issue for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like, <laughs> like they, they, he doesn't quite understand the extent, like that it's something that I can just hide entirely. And so I don't know how to keep that door for conversation open with someone that and, and I, I quote this, he says, there's things that I will personally take to the grave. And this is also one of them. Okay. And so I, I don't know how to talk to someone like that. There's a, a couple things to play here. Okay. First, th- first thing here, any major change, any major change is going to affect the relationship with people. Okay. That is. He gets to decide whether he wants to be in relationship with his wife and her husband and their baby. And you and your wife get to decide what being in relationship with us is going to look like for other people. Here's what we're going to say is okay. Here's what we're going to say is not okay. 
here's what we're going to say is offensive in our home. Here's what we're going to say is not offensive in our home. And here's what we're going to accept. Here's what we're not going to accept. And then that's just called boundaries. And then this is, this is who we're going to be. This is how we're going to roll. This is what our life is going to be. And this is what you're experiencing is something that statistically speaking, most people will never experience, but the principles apply to everybody. In our home, these are our values. This is how we're going to be. And in-laws, parents, friends, coaches, former professors, whoever, if you're going to be in our life, then these, these are our values. These are the jokes that are not okay. This is how we do Thanksgiving. And then I have to, they, get okay. that cho- they get that choice. Go ahead. Yeah, if I had to put a marker on what the value is in this, it's not that anything is particularly offensive or makes me feel bad. I'm I'm actually very okay with with that. But I, I would say my value is that if, when you come into my home, that we have open conversation and we we discuss the things those those elephants. So maybe having that sitting down with the, your father in law and saying the last conversation we said was that I was something. This was something you were going to take to your grave. I need you to know this is something that you will see and experience if you're in my home. And then your father-in-law gets to decide what he does next. I think that's it. Who do I pay? And here's the deal. You've spent your whole life making sure other people are okay. That kept you from getting killed. And so you still have an inclination to make sure everybody around you is all right. And if you and I were sitting down and we had longer to spend together, I would ask you, or, well, I'll just ask you here. Are you interested in, you've said several times, like, I wanted this just to be done. Was that, a, was that shame talking or is that, man, I really don't like the way this compulsive behavior builds up in me? Uh, shame and fear. And since I've been expressing myself more, I get more outward love from everyone in my across communities. Um, it's, it's almost affirming behavior. Right. And that's, that's some of the, the psychology that people come out against is that right now we're in a season when it's, it feels so good. So many people come up and high five you that it, it, it reinforces your body like, ah, oh, I'm extra safe. Right. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. So I guess, I guess what I'll tell you is, man, you and your wife have to come to some sort of agreement on here's who we are and here's who we're going to be. And here's, what's, here's what we talk about in our home. And here's what we don't talk about in our home. And then, like millions and millions and millions of people, you've got to decide, are we going to let in-law A and B come into our house and make their political jokes and complain about the food and whatever? And if we're just going to do it for a weekend, that's fine. No, they're great. I love them. I, I, I really do feel resolution in, in hearing just that, that simple statement to to tell them, hey, last time we had the discussion, it seemed like something that you might take to your grave. But when you're in our home, it's something that you might experience and be around. And I want you to know, I love you guys. You could not have asked for better in-laws. And it's important to me in our house that everybody is safe to, to, to talk. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's great. And expect there to be pushback, and maybe maybe not, but I would I would expect that. Does that sound does that, does that sound fair? Yeah, a hundred percent. Okay, are you seeing somebody for anxiety? I'm not. I've I've seen people over time uh, for for periods of time, and then kind of float in and out. I guess COVID kind of disrupted that it for a bit. Okay, how old's your little one? Five months. Here's what I can almost guarantee has happened when your wife got pregnant. That the, uh, actually you said it, the compulsion there, your body remembers, your body remembers the abuse, your body remembers the hurt, your body remembers the exclusion, your body remembers all of it. And it will recall those stories with your little one. That's why I'm so hesitant to say like, this is just me versus this is how my body's trying to stay safe. It's a way it releases this anxiety. Okay. Here's what I'm telling you. I believe that. I want you to go sit with somebody who's good, a mental health professional that's good. 
Now, hear me say, I don't think you have a mental health disorder because you enjoy wearing women's clothes. Uh, I think anyone who says that's incorrect. I think you are desperate to stop feeling so anxious all the time. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. As a guy who's gone through seasons when I couldn't breathe, being so anxious I can't breathe, and I try to solve it with a flurry of activity, both in my head and both in action. You get exhausted and I get exhausted. I get low and the whole cycle repeats again. So I want you to reach out to somebody and say, just had a new baby. My childhood was unfathomable. I want to have peace. For the first time in my life, I want to have peace. And I've laid a great foundation. I don't owe anybody any money. I've got family who loves me. I've got a ride or die wife. She even laughs at me. She's great. I've got a kid who loves me, a kid who's healthy. I'm ready to find peace. Matt, you are worth that. Your little one's worth that. Your wife is worth that. <sighs> Thank you for being brave. Thank you for being courageous and saying these things out loud. I know that stuff's hard. And you've had these these you've had this in your soul for a long time. Thank you so much. Your uh, willingness to have open conversations is going to help a lot of people. If I can ever help in any way, holler at me, man. Hey, uh, send him a copy of Own Your Past, Change Your Future too. Hand on the line, Matt, and Jenna's going to get you a copy of that for free on me. And um, give it a read and let me know what you think.